Do you make it say 10 cents? in health often simply referred to as Cadeth. Suzanne, I think I'll have to jump in. Hi, everyone. My name is Peter Chinnick. I'm very sorry about this. There's some technical difficulties uh, uh, with Suzanne McGurn's uh, setup. Uh, a storm went through where she lives today, so she's having difficulty getting in. Uh, to you, Mega C, I will, I will pick up until she's able to, to dial back in. Uh, Tan say, hello and welcome everyone. As I said, I'm Peter Chinnick. I'm the special assistant to uh, the president and CEO at Cadeth. Uh, and it's my privilege to fill in as moderator for a few minutes on today's special World Tuberculosis Day webinar. I'd like to begin with a territorial acknowledgement. Cadeth recognizes the inherent and treaty rights of all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples across this land. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and are committed to moving forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. CADA staff work across Canada, residing on various traditional lands and collaborating with indigenous governments, healthcare providers and community members. Our Ottawa offices are located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Our Toronto offices are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. Wherever you are today, I encourage you to think about where you live and work and to give thanks to the Indigenous people who lived there before you and who live there still and continue to sustain and protect the land you call home. Today is World Tuberculosis Day, an annual initiative to raise public awareness about the devastating health, social, and economic consequences of tuberculosis. M many people think of TB as a disease of the past. Fantine in Les Miserables, Doc Holliday in Tombstone, or Satine in Moulin Rouge. These could easily be the dominant impressions people have of tuberculosis. But the sad reality is that tuberculosis remains one of the world's deadliest infectious killers. According to the World Health Organization, over 4,100 people lose their lives to TB and close to 28,000 people fall ill with this preventable and curable disease every single day. While cases of TB are generally low in Canada compared to other parts of the world, certain regions, communities and populations in Canada are dispropor disproportionately affected by TB. People living in housing and food, living with housing and food insecurity who access culturally informed healthcare, such as newcomers to Canada living in major cities like Toronto are affected by TB to a greater extent. And there is an ongoing TB crisis in many indigenous communities. Adam has done a lot of work on tuberculosis, including a condition level review, which looked at the full range of technologies used to address TB from prevention and detection to treatment and management. Our work is freely available on our website, but we recognize that our work does not tell the full story of tuberculosis care in Canada. Today on World TB Day 2022, we have the distinct pleasure of hosting three exceptional guests who will fill in some of the gaps uh, for us taking us through the history and context of tuberculosis in Canada, the current clinical reality of providing TB care to Indigenous people, and the importance of delivering care in a culturally appropriate way. Nathan Obed is the president of Inuit uh, Tapirat, Tapirit uh, Kanatame, uh, a nonprofit organization representing more than 65,000 Inuit living in Canada. In 2018, Nathan and the Government of Canada announced a joint commitment to eliminate tuberculosis from Inuit regions by the year 2030. He continues to champion this goal passionately. Tina Campbell is an Indigenous woman of Cree ancestry who has spent most of her life in the Canadian Arctic. A registered nurse, she has more than 11 years of experience working within the TB field in various Indigenous communities. Currently, she is the tuberculosis advisor for Northern Intertribal Health Authority, an organization comprising four tribal health partners that serves 33 on-reserve First Nation communities in Northern Saskatchewan. 
Our final speaker is Shauna Whitney of the Seahawk, Okanagan, Arrow Lakes, and Scottish ancestry, born and raised in traditional Sea Elk territory. She has a Bachelor of Nursing degree and a Master of Public Health. Her nursing career has been dedicated to advancing Indigenous health issues and promoting wise practices to help bridge cultural understanding. Welcome panelists and thank you for joining us today. Each of our speakers will have 15 minutes to present uh, because some of them must leave before the end of the hour. We'll take a few questions after each speaker. You can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button on the, in the Zoom control panel. To help me keep track, please let me know which speaker your question is directed to. And with that, I'd like to invite uh, Nathan Obed to start things off. Thank you so much, and thank you for that uh, warm introduction. As I've been introduced, my name is Nathan Obed. I'm the president of Nui Tepari Kanatami. Uh, as you can see in the first slide, there's our logo. We have four uh, regions of Inuit in Canada. Each one of those has a modern treaty or land claim agreement. And each of the presidents sit um, as a board of directors for our national organization. And I'm elected uh, once every four years. Uh, I want to recognize World TB Day and uh, think about all the challenges that, that we still encounter with tuberculosis across the Inuit Nunagat and across the Indigenous population in Canada. And use, we have been using this day to um, further educate Canadians and the world about the challenges that we still face. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Tuberculosis is still a public health crisis um, in Canada for Indigenous communities. TB is both preventable and curable and shouldn't be allowed to spread in our communities. And um, this is something that I just reflect on one of my first meetings with Minister Philpot when she was first um, uh, um, appointed to the role of, of health minister. She was looking at me incredul incredulously when I was talking to her about the incidence of TB across Inuit Nunagat. And then she looked, uh, so there are 65,000 Inuit. We're not talking about millions and millions of people. No, we're not. <laughs> so um, when you bring new people into a, this field, there is some um, shock about the numbers and about the lack of, um, of progress that we have all made collectively towards eliminating TB across Indigenous communities and across uh, specifically for uh, my purview, um, Inuit Nunagat. Next slide, please. Here's a just a, a small a graph of the uh, distribution of tuberculosis cases in Canada, and this is 2017 data. Uh, we are still working with uh, data that is a a little bit old. We um, look forward to having updated numbers quite soon. But as you can see, uh, most of Canada's incidents of TB come from uh, individuals who were foreign born, who were exposed uh, to active TB and how came to Canada with latent TB or active TB from other countries. Um, the indigenous um, section is 17.4%. And then within the Indigenous section, you can see um, First Nations have the highest number of active uh, number of cases of tuberculosis, but Inuit are not far behind. We have a population of uh, just about 65,000 and uh, the First Nations have a much larger population. So proportionately, Inuit are the most affected group um, when it comes to tuberculosis in the country. Next slide, please. Here's the current state of tuberculosis amongst Inuit. Uh, from 2008 to 2018, uh, the rate of TB was well over 300 times the rate of TB among Canadian born non-Indigenous people. This is the rate that we have been using publicly. This is what we, uh, but it, it, it does need some breaking, some breaking down. Um, there's 4.8 cases per 100,000 for all of Canada and 205 cases per 100,000 for the population of Inuit and Inuit Nunangat. Uh, 
so we're not talking about thousands and thousands of cases, but when we have such a small population, um, the, the numbers do uh, sometimes become uh, much larger than uh, is, is sometimes even fathomable. No matter, uh, TB is a curable disease, as I've stated, and one that we shouldn't expect that there are any cases of, of TB amongst Inuit and Inuit Nunagat. Or if there are, there are um, stringent public health measures that automatically go into place to ensure that uh, any sort of outbreaks can be contained. Next slide, please. To, to do that, um, we need to address this from all levels of government, and we need collaboration and resources uh, from provinces, from territories, and from the federal government. We need um, efforts from cabinet ministers, but we also need efforts from frontline healthcare workers and community members, um, Inuit organizations. Everyone has a role to play in tuberculosis elimination. Uh, we have um, a sad history of uh, tuberculosis in our communities. We have um, some um, challenges of getting people to come forward and, and get tested and then uh, go through treatment. We also have challenges for um, getting resources for our infrastructure and our public health and our health care systems to ensure that um, people who are sick get the care that they deserve. And also um, the social determinants of health are met, especially housing and food security. Next slide, please. I talked a bit about infrastructure. Uh, here is um, a map that shows how Inuit access healthcare. There are 51 communities across Inuit Nunagat. Of those 51 communities, there are hospitals in Kujuak, in Akaluit. Um, there are some uh, services available in Rankin Inlet, and there's also a hospital in Inuvik. <clears throat> the rest of the communities are serviced largely by health centers and um, nurses. So that means any sort of um, illness beyond um, scrapes and bruises and, and uh, colds and flus needs to be referred out to other places. Um, so if you're living in Pond Inlet, you might fly to Akaluit and then you might fly to Ottawa. So your care might be received 3,000 kilometers away from, from your home. Uh, this is a remnant of the way in which tuberculosis historically uh, was, was treated uh, by the federal government for Inuit, and I'll get to that in a moment, but just wanted to, to flag to all of you the, um, the way the care is provided is so different. We don't have negative pressure um, capabilities in any of our facilities across Inuit Nunagat for, for uh, patients with active TB. Anyone who has active TB who needs to be treated uh, most likely needs to go on a medevac flight um, to one of these southern centers. The cost on the healthcare system is enormous, and also the cost on the mental health and the, um, the social uh, fabric of our communities is um, challenged by the way in which care is provided or in many cases is not provided. Um, people have to weigh accessing healthcare with um, all sorts of other factors in their life. And if somebody is going through crisis, if somebody is uh, going through challenges, if somebody has fear of the medical system because of some of the human rights abuses that have happened to their family members or to themselves, um, there then are challenges in, in um, that person identifying for care and then getting treatment. Next slide, please. I've talked a little bit uh, about the historical context, but it's incredibly important to not only uh, couch the Inuit side of this, but also the indigenous side of this um, when, when thinking about solutions and also thinking about the challenge itself. Uh, first off, next slide please, there are three indigenous peoples in Canada, First Nations, Inuit and Métis. Um, we, have um, each a line in, in the Constitution in Section 35, 
that recognizes these three um, uh, distinct indigenous peoples. I reference it not to put up silos between indigenous peoples in the country, more uh, um, we have so much in common and we work so well together. Um, but at the same time, from an administrative, from a legislative and from a historical colonial perspective, there are so many different histories. And uh, um, many times Inuit uh, um, don't have access to the same resources or don't fall under the same piece of legislation or don't fall under the same Supreme Court ruling. And so therefore are treated very differently. Uh, the same for Métis, the same for First Nations. So it is important for people to understand that a distinctions-based lens uh, is really a path to understanding on a lot of this work. And then also the solutions have to be considerate of the legislative and policy and overarching colonial framework that still exists in this country. Next slide. Here's a, a map of Inuit Nunangat. I've already mentioned the term um, a few times. But if you imagine this as a geopolitical space, this is about 35% of Canada's landmass, uh, over 60% of Canada's coastline. Uh, there are 51 communities in this space, all linked together through a common ethnicity, uh, being Inuk, um, a common language, Inuktut, and, um, and a common relationship with the Crown through modern treaties. So what you see here are the combined total of our um, land claim settlement areas. And there are uh, four different, five, well, five different agreements. There are two in Nunavik, but there are different agreements that set out the rules around how this space is, is um, governed and uh, the ownership and access of being needed along the space. So we have co-management over, um, land and waters, about resource development, uh, uh, many different things across the entirety of this space that you see, uh, that it comprises Inuit Nunangat. And our political relationship with the Crown is also very similar, even if it is separate from the regional uh, region to region. This is very important because often from a policy perspective, um, people start with this muddled sense of, well, north of 60, or Atlantic Canada or Western Canada or indigenous, uh, we are uh, trying to get Canada to uh, work on Inuit specific issues through an Inuit Nunangat policy lens. And uh, when you think about 35% of the country falling under a particular space, uh, we think it's only right. And uh, it actually um, would make the interventions a, uh, a lot better if this concept was utilized. Next slide, please. The historical context of, among um, Inuit for TB is really stark. Uh, we were first uh, in contact with um, European explorers and whalers. They brought tuberculosis. Uh, there was an epidemic that had ensued in our communities uh, and especially was exacerbated when many Inuit uh, were coerced into living into Southern style communities in the 1950s. The, in the first half of the 1900s, the rate of TB amongst Inuit uh, was approximately 1500 to 2000 cases per 100,000. And there were not effective public health strategies to combat this epidemic in community. Often what would happen would be um, Inuit, as you can see in the picture, were boarded, uh, were sent uh, by ship to Southern Sanatorium. And they were there for sometimes years. And sometimes they would be dropped back off in other communities, hundreds of kilometers away from their homes. Uh, there was largely no communication between those patients, their patients and their families. If there were um, dependents, if there were children that were with uh, uh, parents or extended family members, they were not treated in the same facilities and could hardly ever visit them. So 
this is, I mean, it's a, it's an, it's an incredibly terrible thing to imagine that the Canadian government was, was delivering this health service to Inuit. Um, the trauma related to this particular aspect of healthcare is still um, acutely felt amongst Inuit communities today. It was, um, uh, as, a, as a plan, this, this did lower the rate of tuberculosis uh, over time, but with terrible human costs uh, beyond tuberculosis. Next slide, please. We worked with uh, uh, the government of Canada to, um, to have the government of Canada apologize to Inuit about the treatment of Inuit through their TB program from the 40s to the 60s. In March 2019, uh, the Prime Minister publicly apologized and officially launched the Nani Lavut initiative. This initiative was for three things. Uh, first, it was to access all documents, health records, so that there could be a database created so that family members could find lost loved ones. There were hundreds of people who just disappeared, who did not come home. People did not know if they were sick or died, or if they sometimes, in the case of children, there was fear that those children were um, adopted out into Southern communities. Uh, just tragic stories um, uh, coming from all across the Arctic. So the Prime Minister did apologize and put funds forward for uh, families to find lost loved ones, also for there to be visits to grave sites, if grave sites were found, or commemoration events within communities. Um, it's really important to, to recognize that all of this happened and it continues to affect the way that Inuit interact with TB today. Next slide, please. Here's just a, um, a different way of describing the incidence of tuberculosis across Inuit Nunagat. Uh, as you can see that um, each of our four land claim regions have different rates of tuberculosis. This is uh, 2016 data. I'm sorry, 2018 data. And it shows that um, we still have pockets of, of huge rates of tuberculosis, such as in Nunatsiavut, 580 times the national average. But then it also shows signs of hope. So in the West, the Inuvialuit region um, that hasn't had um, tuberculosis uh, for a, a number of years, and that is a huge success. We, uh, next slide, please. We have worked to um, eliminate tuberculosis through a social determinants of health lens. And you can see food security and housing um, and well-being, um, safety and income, uh, education, uh, livelihood, connection to culture and language and family, early childhood development, all of these things um, need to be focused on in order for us to achieve optimal health. Um, in, re in relation to tuberculosis, uh, this is even more pronounced. Next slide, please. Uh, we continue to have challenges with healthcare and accessing the healthcare system. We have, um, as I've described earlier, unnecessary barriers to accessing health services, especially through the distance. We also um, have systemic discrimination on the basis of service quality, uh, especially since the lack of doctors across Inuit Nunagat, and also considering that our language is one of the strongest Indigenous languages in Canada, we still face systemic discrimination on the ability to have service in our language. Imagine that there is a jurisdiction, Nunavut, that has a dominant language spoken by the majority that has no official status when it comes to the federal government delivery of services. That's uh, Inuktu. We hoped that the Indigenous Languages Act that was passed uh, two years ago now would create official language status for Inuktu in our homeland across Inuit Nunagat, but the federal government uh, wouldn't go there. It still then links to systemic discrimination uh, in the way in which healthcare is delivered, because when Inuit are crossing jurisdictions and going into uh, 
um, scenarios for care, often uh, they can't speak their language and can't understand what is happening um, based on uh, their inability to speak French or English. Next slide, please. In 2018, uh, we at ITK partnered with the Government of Canada to eliminate tuberculosis across Inuit Nunavut by 2030. Uh, we also pledged to reduce TB by 50% by 2025. This was the first time that the Government of Canada had has publicly pledged to reduce a, um, a gap in uh, social determinants of health uh, that Inuit have uh, with the rest of Canada um, in, in public. It's the first time that the Canada has ever pledged to do that. And it was on tuberculosis. Um, and we have been working uh, on an elimination framework and working with the federal government ever since. Next slide, please. We have worked across Inuit Nunangat on this TB elimination framework on how to self-determine the way in which Inuit work with public governments to end tuberculosis. It's going to take a number of different concurrent interventions, increased funding for housing, increased funding for food security, uh, increased um, access to, um, to community screenings that identify tuberculosis, active tuberculosis, novel ways to treat tuberculosis, and then uh, ways in which to ensure that uh, this is all done in a culturally safe way. We have uh, been working on a housing strategy that was released a year and a half ago. We also have, um, are releasing an Inuit food security strategy on how to address these concurrent challenges as well, so that it isn't just a blind wish, that we have ways in which we are going to get to this, this end goal. Next slide, please. <clears throat> With our First Nations and Métis partners, we co-authored uh, Chapter 12 in the new Canadian TB standards. It's coming out today. This chapter lays out the best practices to guide the practice of those coming to Indigenous communities to, to provide TB care. <clears throat> so I encourage everyone who's working with Indigenous communities in providing TB care to read this chapter, to further your education, and expand on the points raised during my presentation, and also the ones that follow me. I also encourage people to go to our website, itk.ca, to learn more about um, the different strategies and the different concepts that uh, I've presented here today. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nathan. I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, we're a bit tight on time, so we're going to skip the questions, unfortunately, and move directly to our next speaker. So I'm going to invite Tina Campbell to, uh, to start her presentation. Again, Nathan, thank you very much. Tina, I think you're still on mute. Hello, sorry about that. <laughs> of course, some technical difficulties here. All right, so I'll just get right into it. Hello to all. Um, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. And I'm honored to be here today alongside two amazing Indigenous advocates. Um, thank you, President Obed, for starting the webinar off with a very informative presentation. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So I'd like to acknowledge that I am talking to you today from Treaty 6, the traditional territory of the Cree and the homeland of the Métis people. Next slide. I would like to declare that I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this topic or presentation. My outline for today will cover four main areas. Um, what is NETHA? A little overview of what tuberculosis is. Um, touch on TB and stigma in relation to the historical TB care of Indigenous people. And a discussion on how to move forward with care. I'd also like to provide a trigger warning. Parts of this discussion surrounding um, surrounds tuberculosis sanatoriums 
residential schooling, intergenerational trauma, and may be triggering for many. <clears throat> Please remember to practice self-care, reach out to talk to others if you need to decompress following this presentation. Next slide. So a brief overview of my experience with TB care. Um, it began in 2010 when I was given a summer placement as a nursing student at a TB clinic. I graduated from Nunavut Arctic College nursing program in 2013 and became a public health nurse. My main role was uh, a TB clinical coordinator. Following that, I served as a territorial TB educator. And since September of 2019, I have been the tuberculosis advisor for Northern Intertribal Health Authority. I have also been recently appointed as co-chair for the Stop TB Canada Steering Committee. Next slide, please. So NITA is a First Nations partner, First Nations partnership organization comprised of four partner organizations that are listed above. Together, we provide and maintain health services in 33 First Nations communities in Northern Saskatchewan. NITA provides third level services to these partners that include disease surveillance, communicable disease control, health status monitoring, epidemiology, specialized program support, advisory services, research planning, education, training and technical support. NITA is the only First Nations organization of its kind in Canada. Next slide. So some of our TB program responsibilities. In our TB program, we aim to quickly identify, screen and refer clients for preventative treatment for those who have been exposed to someone with active TB. Educating communities about TB, its symptoms, risk factors for developing TB disease, and the importance of seeing a healthcare provider early. Uh, we work on supporting TB program workers and community health nurses to administer direct observed therapy and support TB programming in communities. And we work in partnership with Saskatchewan uh, TB Prevention and Control, Indigenous Services, and other stakeholders to help develop and implement effective strategies to work towards TB elimination. Next slide. So just to provide a visual of the TB rates in our jurisdiction, here is a graph representing active TB rates by NITA, Saskatchewan First Nations on Reserve, Saskatchewan and Canada from 2011 to 2021. You can see at the bottom, Canada and Saskatchewan's rates per 100,000 is considerably low. However, the farther it is broken down, for example, into all First Nations on reserve communities in Saskatchewan, the number increases. And finally, you'll see in the red, uh, NISA uh, and the high numbers there. In 2021, it spiked up to 131 per 100,000 um, people. Nearing the end, we had declared two outbreaks of TB in our communities. Next slide. So a few facts about TB. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates about 23% of the world's population is infected with TB. Globally, every year, 10 million people fall ill with TB, despite being a preventable and curable disease. 1.5 million people die from TB each year. Global efforts to combat TB have saved an estimated 66 million lives since the year 2000. However, COVID-19 pandemic has reversed years of progress made in the fight to end TB. For the first time in over a decade, TB deaths increased in 2020. Next slide. So what is tuberculosis? TB is caused by a disease, is, is a disease caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacillus. TB usually affects the lungs, but can also affect other parts of the body, like your bones, joints, kidneys, the brain, and reproductive organs. TB is transmitted via droplet nuclei containing TB bacteria. It can remain in the air for hours after someone with TB coughs, sneezes, or sings. TB is not spread by touching surfaces or sharing objects. Once you breathe in, sorry, next slide. Once you breathe in the TB bacteria, your body uh, may take the bacteria and lock it up and it may never develop into active TB. This happens to about 90% of the people who become infected and it remains in a latent state. With this latent TB infection, the TB bacteria have infected a person but aren't growing. The person as well doesn't have any symptoms and cannot spread TB to others. 
Many people with latent TB never develop TB disease. However, there is always a potential that it can progress into active TB if left untreated or if your immune system weakens. About five to 10% of people go on to develop active TB disease at some point in their life. Um, with active TB, the bacteria has started to multiply and grow and symptoms start to develop and a person may start to feel very unwell. You can spread active TB of the lungs and throat to others and it can become fatal if left untreated. Next slide. So some signs um, of active TB disease. Uh, some common ones include cough lasting longer than two to three weeks, night sweats, fever, unexplained weight loss. For extra pulmonary TB, so TB that's not found in the lungs, can be hard to diagnose or assess, as you can imagine from the list of symptoms um, on this slide. It can mimic other illnesses. Diagnosing, treating, and preventing TB in children can be challenging and failing to do so can have devastating consequences for children and their families, communities, and healthcare providers. This is why it is important that healthcare professionals are given an orientation informing them of the incidence of TB in communities they provide their services so that TB can be on their list of differential diagnosis. Next slide. Treatment for TB can be anywhere from three months to 12 months or more, depending on the type, location, and severity of disease. Latent TB and active TB are both treatable. In my experience, it is often hard to convince someone to take LTBI treatment. And if someone starts LTBI treatment, a lot of encouragement and support may be required to ensure treatment completion. This is where education and information sharing is critical. Since those with latent TB do not have any symptoms, we have to ensure we inform clients about the risk of it developing into active TB without treatment. Not completing treatment for LTBI or active TB disease can put you at an increased risk for antibiotic resistance. As you can see by the picture of the medication, that is a single daily dose for someone on initial phase of TB treatment for active TB. Active TB is treated with at least four antibiotics at the beginning. It is really important to note how much a TB diagnosis can change your life and lifestyle while you are on treatment. TB not only impacts one physically, but socially, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. People overcome so much throughout the course of treatment and overcoming obstacles and reaching treatment completion and cure is such an amazing thing to be a part of as a practitioner. Next slide. So the treatment standard in Canada for TB is done by direct observed therapy or DOT. This is where a trained healthcare practitioner will administer and sign for each dose that a client takes. DOT can require a lot of resources, time, and a collaborative effort. It can be done at the health center, at a client's home, school, or workplace. DOT encourages treatment completion with regular safe monitoring and clinic visits. Often DOT can be challenging as people do not want anyone to know they are being treated for TB for various reasons. They may experience stigma, they may experience strained or loss of relationships, and they may have to deal with other people's negative perceptions of TB and some even experience loss of income because they do not want to tell anybody about their TB diagnosis. Next slide. Some risk factors that increase your risk of TB are, if you have recent or ongoing contact with someone who has active TB, if you have an LTBI diagnosis within the last two years, and if it is untreated. If you have other health conditions such as chronic renal failure, cancer, diabetes, or HIV infection. If you smoke cigarettes or if you are under the age of five. After a child is exposed to someone with TB, the disease can develop rapidly, sometimes in life-threatening forms, such as miliary TB and TB meningitis. If you are Canadian-born Indigenous living in areas where there is increased activity, you are also at a higher risk. So why? Um, so in President Obed's um, presentation, he did touch on the social determinants of health, uh, and we are aware of the inequities that our Indigenous populations face. Um, therefore, I'm going to specifically uh, focus on stigma. TB is heavily stigmatized. Some people think TB is a disease of people in poverty, substance users, or with people who have HIV infection. Stigma is also present in Indigenous com communities due to the historical events in relation to TB. Negative experiences from view, form views um, of TB within a family unit, and this 
these views are passed down from generation to generation. Stigma affects one's hesitancy to access care due to mistrust and mistrust towards institutions. Next slide. So a brief, a uh, couple brief slides on the history of TB and in Indigenous population with a shift of focus on First Nations and Métis populations. TB was spread to First Nations and Métis on the prairies about 130 years ago when the Canadian Pacific Railway was built and the reserve system established. Malnutrition increased the risk of disease and the confinement of First Nations people on crowded reserves allowed the disease to spread rapidly. Next slide, please. Residential schools for Indigenous children existed in Canada from the 17th century until the late 1900s. The last residential school closed in 1996 in Saskatchewan. During the years that the system was in place, children were forcibly removed from their homes and at school were often subjected to harsh discipline, malnutrition and starvation. Poor health care, physical, emotional and sexual abuse, neglect and deliberate suppression of their cultures and languages. Thousands of children died while attending residential schools and the burial sites remain unknown. Next slide. So I will take this time to state that I did not become aware of the historical events in their entirety until I was in my twenties. I do not ever recall learning anything in school. I had only heard of TB when my kukum or my grandmother would tell stories about when she had TB and was sent away. It wasn't until after her passing, I learned that she was sent twice. The picture above shows the sanatorium in which she attended in Fort Capel, Saskatchewan, nearly 500 kilometers away from where she lived. She had spoke about being so lonely for her seven young children that she would not eat. She remembers being told that if she feeds her body, this could help get her get better, which would mean she could go home. This motivated her. She eventually returned home, but I'm sure she felt tremendous guilt for being away from my grandpa and her children. I also learned that my aunt was sent to the same sanatorium at the same time as my kukum. She recalls being in a big room that had rows and rows of beds for children. It was in the basement. Although she was in the same institution as her mother, they were not able to see each other. When the children were allowed to go outside, she said she would sit under this big tree and look up into the windows in hopes to catch a glimpse of her mother. They could only wave to each other. So children being sent to separate buildings away from their parents. Can you imagine your child being sent for treatment somewhere and you were not there to console them while they were hurting or consent to treatment or procedures? Next slide. So the purpose of Indian hospitals was to address the prevalence and spread of tuberculosis and the fear that affected Indigenous populations would endanger nearby non-Indigenous populations. Hospitals were often overcrowded, practices such as experimental treatment or painful and disabling surgeries were prevalent, even at a time when general hospitals were switching to less invasive treatments for TB. Although enforced hospitalization and physical restraining of patients was not permissible in a general hospital setting, they were considered common practice at Indian hospitals. Next slide. So often it's difficult uh, to fully understand stigma if you're not the one experiencing it. There are three main types of stigma. Individual stigma happens when an individual begins to believe and internalize the negative public attitudes they encounter. As a result, that individual might begin to hide their diagnosis from others. Interpersonal stigma is stigma that is directed at an individual by someone else, usually someone who does not suffer from the same condition. And structural stigma occurs on a larger scale and refers to stigma that is embedded in institution and policies. Historical TB control practices in Canada have contributed to um, discrimination. Oh, sorry, contributed stigma and discrimination towards those with the disease, as well as fear and mistrust of the health system. Um, these individual and system level factors result in delays in TB diagnosis, ongoing transmission, poor outcomes, and lower treatment completion rates. Stigma and discrimination are recognized as the most identified human rights related barrier to ending the TB epidemic, limiting access to TB services and negatively impacting the quality of life. Next slide. So how can we move forward with care? Next slide. The importance of understanding um, cultural and historical events when providing care for indigenous populations is tremendously important. We need to work towards mandatory training for service providers um, in indigenous communities. 
we need to talk about TB in our communities, whether you reside on reserve or off reserve or in urban settings, providing resources and information in languages known to the area you reside or work as well. <clears throat> Engaging leadership in all organizations, encouraging community health programs to pr prioritize TB, especially in areas with TB activities. Next slide. So it is our responsibility um, to uphold the Truth and Reconciliation Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to action, specifically number 23. We call upon all levels of government to increase the number of Aboriginal professionals working in the healthcare field, ensure the retention of Aboriginal healthcare providers in Aboriginal communities, and provide cultural competency, competency training for healthcare and professionals. Next slide. Um, Cultural competency, the benefits of cultural competence in healthcare, improved health out outcomes, increased access to care, integrating patient beliefs into his or her treatment or care plan, and encouraging and supporting an Indigenous workforce. Next slide. So here's my favorite slide of my presentation. Um, it's a slide of Indigenous representation from all over Canada at varying levels of the healthcare field. <clears throat> and I just wanted to share um, a, two quotes from two of these healthcare providers. So one reason I wanted to become a nurse was to utilize the invaluable Inuit knowledge that was passed to me from many generations of family lineage within Nunavut's healthcare system. Also to be able to care for individuals in my Inuktut language and way of being and knowing. It has been an incredible journey. And that is, um, her name's Nancy Mike and she's a registered nurse up in Nunavut. And the second quote is, I became a nurse back in the day as there wasn't many Aboriginal nurses. I went to residential school in Beauval and there was a nurse there. She was Cree speaking and I thought that that was so amazing. I thought of her through the years and decided I will and can do that too. Go back and help my people in gaining their autonomy. It does definitely help to speak the Dene language as well. People seem more comfortable. And even if I speak English, they will speak Dene in their responses. To speak the language definitely allows a person to fit in just that much more. And that quote was given by Barb George, one of our TB nurses. Next slide. <clears throat> so additional steps that we can take. Um, we can reach out to government and organizations to uh, demand updated data. So our last TB data uh, was published in 2019, and it was from data from 2017, which is insufficient for addressing the TB situation in Canada. Uh, investments in TB research and development. Investing in research and development for TB is essential to improving current TB technologies, which are largely outdated. The only vaccine against TB will turn 101 years old this year and lacks effectiveness. Current treatment for TB is long, complicated, and toxic. Imagine treating a one-year-old with those four antibiotics every day for two months. It can be challenging. We need friendlier options for children. Making TB programming a priority. We are finally coming out of two years of COVID-19 pandemic that has thrown our health systems into disarray and highlighted how social inequities transform into disparities and illness. It is critical to ensure that TB prevention and care is part of the post-pandemic recovery. And if you have a chance, um, take a look at the Stop TB Canada. They released a report on COVID-19 and its impact on Canadian TB programming. So in conclusion, TB is very much still around, especially within our Indigenous populations. If you're residing in an Indigenous community <clears throat> with a history of TB, educate yourself on the disease and the historical events. Call upon local um, management directors and to look into cultural competency training for all their staff. Increasing awareness um, to leadership at varying levels and work towards prioritizing prioritizing TB programming in communities. Um, we all have the same goal. Next slide. And it's to end TB in our communities. And that's uh, a picture of my son. Next slide. Thank you um, for this opportunity. And I hope everybody um, learned a little something today. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, 
Jose, for some reason, I cannot uh, restart my video, so I'll just speak. Tina, that was a great presentation. I love the picture of your son and some really important messages there. Really appreciate it. I know we're running a bit late today because of the technical difficulties we had off the top, so I'm going to skip the question period. I'm also going to extend the session a little bit longer so that our final speaker doesn't feel pressured for time and can have her full 15 minutes to uh, for her presentation. So Shauna, please over to you. Thank you. Thank you to Tan and Tina for uh, the important history and context of TB. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, my name is Shauna Whitney and I'm a CD nurse specialist for TB surveillance for the First Nations Health Authority. Next slide. I am calling in today from my traditional unceded territory of the Seal Okanagan people in the interior of British Columbia. And with this, I like to bring along my grandmother and one of my grand, grandbabies in the photo. Next slide. Um, I would like to first acknowledge that I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this topic or presentation. Uh, today's overview for you will take you through a glimpse of First Nations Health Authority, TB in British Columbia, and how we create culturally safe service delivery. I'll also offer a case study and some key concepts when creating TB education and curriculum for healthcare providers. Next slide. FNHA is a relatively young health organization. It was created from a 2005 signing of a tripartite agreement in British Columbia between First Nation leadership, BC Ministry of Health and the Federal Government of Canada. And this was established in response to the inequities in health status of First Nations people here in BC. So presently, FNHA operates to support and be a partner in the journey of health and wellness for BC First Nation communities. It's a very unique approach that is very nation driven. We each do our part in our programs of service delivery to make the best possible experience and outcome for our clients. That is our goal for uh, tuberculosis elimination. Next slide. So partnerships in TB services, our TB team, we might be small, but we're mighty. And we provide case management, education, training, data entry and TB surveillance in BC. We of course uh, play a crucial supportive role in the community working predominantly with nurses, clients, physicians, uh, regional health authorities and healthcare providers such as our DOT community workers. We also have a long-standing partnership with the BC Center for Disease Control, and that is where our laboratory testing and our pharmacy for all of the TB medications comes from. It's a centralized service here in British Columbia. And of course, we get our direct vision, uh, physician support and guidance from uh, the team physicians there. Next slide. So our current data, for 2019 to 21 is being analyzed at this time in BC. So uh, we do produce an annual TB report and that's going to be issued at the end of March. So in the meantime, I've included an infograph snapshot of uh, uh, BC from 2008. Uh, so 7.5 per 100,000 for status First Nations, as you can see, um, it's actually one of the lowest rates we, we have had um, compared to the past. But as you can see, we have a long way to go to decreasing TB rates to meet the WHO elimination goal of one per 100,000. But uh, depending on an outbreak situation in one of our communities, this number can jump quite significantly given our lower population. But on average, our rates have been predominantly anywhere between one and a half to three times higher than the BC average. Uh, but not shown in this slide, the BC uh, average rate in 2017 was 
and the Canadian incident rate in 2017 was at 4.9 per 100,000. So in BC, we have 199 recognized First Nation communities. We have 30 different languages spoken and over 200,000 indig Indigenous residents here in BC. Next slide. Cultural safety and humility. We acknowledge that the foundation of cultural safety, humility in our organization is woven through our programs and is of our values. FNHA and all regional health authorities in BC have a responsibility and accountability to address systemic racism in healthcare here. We of course have the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Report and the In Plain Sight Report uh, on systemic racism here in BC. So for that reason, we have many reasons to improve access and care for First Nations people. So cultural safety really is outcome-based. This really comes down to a goal, a sense of the patient being cared for and having experienced good care that only the client can describe. The cultural humility piece is a process of self-reflection from the provider. It takes a lot of critical work to see systems and policies and organizational barriers for what they are, but it's even more to actually look at one's own biases. So this is a really lifelong uh, learning piece of it. From a decolonizing lens, you know, one must continually ask themselves where they are practicing from. Is it a place of fear? Is it a place of love, compassion? Colonialism was founded on fear and suppression. And we want the complete opposite in our thoughts and actions and in our, and in our TV program. Next slide. From a First Nations perspective, the process and outcome of our relationship with each other is key to building that trust and respect. So these are some cultural groundings that are a reminder of the values that are important to all relationships. And these groundings are needed for successful TB outreach work. And just a couple, if you can't see the slides, uh, we are open. Uh, we open our hearts to hear difficult truths. We hear the stories. We value experience and lessons, and we honor the connections uh, with another. Next slide. So here's an example of a more complex case study that uh, we work with uh, in communities. Uh, this particular case study was part of a cluster of TB in an urban setting. And we actually have partnered with another Indigenous-based organization to provide culturally relevant TB care. Why? Because the Regional Health Authority at the time was challenged to provide the appropriate care and resources needed. Our gold standard for our program is daily DOT whenever possible and with a holistic approach to case management. Just because cases in the urban setter, setting doesn't mean that they won't actually come into on reserve families. It's, there's a network. So on off reserve, TB knows no boundaries. So you can see how challenging in this case study this person's life is, but with the skill sets of the nurse and the coordinator and DOT workers, they were actually able to get uh, treatment initiated and continued for this person. So each person we treat, we require a real unique care plan uh, and not all are so complex. 34 year old First Nations female, she was a contact, she had developed fever and cough, she was confirmed on PCR to have uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. She was a case of pulmonary TB. She had no physical home address, staying in between multiple locations, physical mobility issues, recent hospitalizations with infection, multi-substance use, underweight, and very malnourished. Next slide. 
So healthcare providers needed to take the time to uncover these gifts with this client and work on a care plan that was acceptable and realistic with the client. So some of the client's strengths that they found was uh, her motivation to feel better. She was accepting of the assistance. She was honest about her needs and the limits that um, she had. There was a trust and mutual respect and kindness that occurs in uh, building a relationship. Um, the client efforts to also ensure the safety of others, the nurses and the DOT workers, sometimes in environments that uh, wouldn't seem safe to the general person. So that really showed uh, respect for the healthcare providers. Next slide. So the, the cultural safety and action piece, I chose uh, respect and trust because they go hand in hand with relationships. So with Indigenous perspectives, you know, we have a unique and dark history with Canada as First Peoples experiences with colonization, oppression, and systemic racism. And we also have individual and collective um, experiences. So Respect is universal. Respect, uh, respecting both Indigenous collective and individual experiences, recognizing the challenges and barriers, the trauma responses and the patterns that a care provider may see, and the gaps to accessing care. Respect is also about accepting people for where they're at in their journey. Most important is trust, trust in the process and trust in the time and patience that it will take to uh, create that relationship in a safe space, knowing that safe spaces can be anywhere. Next slide. So the outcomes. Um, of course, our major goal is to treat active TB in people and break any further transmission. Super important to have medications managed and client taking the tre treatments with daily DOT. So yes, we treat much more than TB. Uh, the key lies in how we approach and work with people. So some of the outcomes, and these are really huge wins considering the challenges and barriers the client had. She became non-infectious quite quickly within two months of starting treatment. 97% adherence, so that's pretty darn good considering uh, her experiences before. She's now stable on OAT, which is an opioid agonist therapy. She now has a disability income coming in. There is short-term housing in place. Our program provides incentives and resources to remove barriers to care for people and get them where they need to be. So that included a cell phone, uh, communication, food support, transportation, and of course, it, referral and connection to primary health care providers for some added mental and emotional support. Next slide. So in the literature reviews of teaching and providing education with healthcare providers, our education program at FNHA has been on the right path leading for quite some time. So one of the uh, six of the concepts that we are familiar with is decolonizing practices, reflective learning and relational practice. And what does that mean? So decolonizing is a process. It's deconstructing colonial ideologies, of superiority and privilege of Western thoughts and approaches. From an Indigenous lens, we value and require our land acknowledgements, our culture, language, teachings. They all need to be respected alongside Western medicine. The self-reflection piece for the learner is really for our healthcare providers taking education is to understand societal and media portrayals of Indigenous peoples, the myths and the stereotypes that it has created. And care providers need to undergo this critical self-reflection. Number three, the root causes of health inequities 
Uh, this was spoken to before, but it really is the social determinants of health. Learners need to understand the journey of colonization and the impacts on health outcomes for Indigenous people. Number four, the lived realities and experiences of Indigenous people through stories and TV. We utilize teaching methods in our education program that matter to First Nation people. We bring voices to their TB experiences. Partnering and collaboration with Indigenous educators. We need to do this together. All education that's provided for TB is really taught in partnership with Indigenous facilitators and teachers. We have to support the development of facilitation skill sets with Indigenous peoples. We want success in achieving goals and objectives in education of our healthcare providers. And lastly, cultural safety and humility. So this needs to be part of a normal, healthy functioning organization to be inclusive, respective, and responsive. Next slide, please. So these are just some snapshots of TB essentials for nurses education. We host education sessions about twice a year. It's a solid two and a half days of TB learning when we, when we get back to in-person sessions. We also have TB wellness champion training for our community uh, DOT workers. It's very similar education. As you can see, we have a good mix of resources and curriculum from the history of TB and infectious diseases, um, the utilization of stories from survivors of TB and their families are key. We use these narratives to have nurses critically examine the history of public health, treatment, and review their own practice. We also provide education uh, to nurses in priority screening processes and community. So it's important to focus on those who are at high risk, uh, given the other busy programming that nurses do have in community. Um, we also uh, help uh, go into community and help them set up their TB programs, go through clinical guidelines with them, and all the pathways from testing to treating and follow up. Next slide. So on our FNHA TB uh, resource on our website, uh, we have a lot of resources available on our website. We have uh, videos that help educate the public and some more clinical ones for nurses. And of course, all of our resources uh, come from community feedback and input. Um, they're, they're done in partnership so that we're getting the correct health literacy and appropriateness of the TB messaging across. Next slide. So that is, uh, in a summary, that is just a glimpse into one of our, our TB programs and a case study and what we need for education. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. And in fact, thank you to all three of the amazing speakers we had today. Uh, President Obed, Tina Campbell, and of course, Shauna herself. Uh, I think that they have provided a lot for us in terms of helping us learn and reflect on this important topic. Um, while we wrap up the session, I just wanted to say a couple of things. I apologize for, for uh, it running long. I hope that uh, everyone feels it was time well spent. Uh, we will leave the session open a little bit longer so that people can share any reflections uh, or thoughts they have in the Q and A or the or the chat functions. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for the session today. Uh, on World TB Day, I think it's important that we all give consideration to rising to the challenge that was inherent in all three presentations, that we work together to eradicate tuberculosis in First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities and indeed all around the world. With that, I'll bring the session to the end, but a couple of quick reminders for people. One, we will be sending out a link to the, the presentation in the next couple of days. So you'll be able to download and watch uh, the video at your convenience. And I would ask that you consider joining us on April 5th for the annual CADAP information session. Uh, 
we'll be launching our ambitious new strategic plan for 2022 to 2025 and providing uh, updates on our key programs and initiatives. Until then, remember the pandemic is not over, stay safe. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone.